<laughs> okay. So hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the reprise of the lovely little webinar that I once did. Uh, I'm trying to think it's about a year or so, maybe a little bit more now. And there have been a few updates to it since then. Uh, I will certainly point those out as we go for those of you who may be here a second time. But what we're trying to do today is give people some more ammunition, uh, not only for their own advocacy in their medical appointments, but also overall for the cause of neuropathy when you get involved in those discussions with people who can have influence, be they medical, be they legislative, be they executive. Because uh, as I'm sure many of you know, Neuropathy is the most common neurological condition that nobody knows about. Uh, that's a big problem in terms of getting more attention towards it and research involved with it. And because of that, a long time ago when I was going through this, uh, I decided to compile a list of very useful websites and other communication sites that everyone with neuropathy should at least have some familiarity with. Uh, they're useful in doctor's appointments and in a lot of other circumstances. Uh, part of the reason that I originally compiled these is that I had a rather unusual neuropathic presentation. Uh, most people are familiar with the situation where they start with symptoms in their feet and it very slowly progresses. Uh, I did start with a symptom in my right foot underneath my fourth toe. But mine was not slowly progressive. It was acute onset. It went from a little tingle under that toe to a burning sensation across the foot and ankle in about three hours. It climbed up there and started in my other foot within six hours. It had climbed up to my waist in about 24. And then it was basically head to toe after about 48, give or take a few hours. Uh, a terrible searing, burning pain. And when people ask me how to describe it, I usually fall back on the explanation that imagine that you got sun poisoning over your entire body and then somebody rubbed it with steel wool. So I definitely think that because of that and because I couldn't get in to see a doctor for quite a while and I was in terrible pain, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, I couldn't tolerate clothing, I was starting to rapidly lose weight. Um, it was a very, very scary situation, but I was fortunate, even though it was hard to do except in small bursts, to be able in an internet age to start researching. Um, when I finally got into the doctor's offices, uh, they thought I might have multiple sclerosis, which I understood later was not a bad guess. 43-year-old guy presents with a sudden onset of body-wide neural pain. Uh, it's certainly on the short list of differential diagnoses. But a lot of testing for multiple sclerosis later, which included MRIs and spinal taps and the VOC potentials, uh, nothing came up. And fortunately, they got me ramped up on gabapentin enough that it knocked down the symptoms to the point where, while I wouldn't say they were tolerable, I could actually get a little sleep in and food down, and I could do further research. And my further research led me to some theories uh, that I'd had some sort of Guillain-Barre analog that involved the small fibers. But I learned that by going through the internet and finding some very, very good sites. Now, of course, this took me a long time. Part of the reason for compiling them is so that for all of you, it won't take you so long. And what I will now do, if I can, is do a screen share. Let's see if I can get that to come up so you can see my PowerPoint. And here we go. Hopefully you should all be seeing this now. I know some of you have seen this before. I've done this presentation on a number of other sites and for a number of other organizations. But this is basically my list of essential neuropathy websites for self and cause advocacy. Because knowledge is power, you know, forewarned is forearmed and all those other cliches. And when compiling this, at least for these presentations, 
I sort of broke them down into two separate categories. You're going to see these come up in this order. Uh, the first set of sites I'm going to talk about are sites for diagnosis types and treatments, the more medical nitty gritty side of knowing about neuropathy, uh, how to get a diagnosis, what possibilities there are, what tests you should actually be getting, uh, what types and categories are involved, and even some talks about treatments as well, because certain neuropathies are treatable. Uh, certain autoimmune neuropathies, there are autoimmune modulating therapies that can be tried. And for certain other causes, particularly the ones that are, say, nutritional or toxic, if you can solve the nutritional problem or eliminate the toxin, it's a treatment and your neuropathy might actually get somewhat better. Uh, it's difficult to say how much. Uh, in those cases, not everybody gets improvement. And even those who get improvements, such as myself, the improvement tends to be patchy and incomplete. I'll talk more about that later. But it is important, I think, even though far too many of us wind up in that dreaded idiopathic category, to find to the greatest extent possible what may be causing your neuropathy, because it does influence in many cases what your treatment or what your symptom palliative aspects are going to be going forward. So that's one set of sites. The second set are more general information and public advocacy sites. And these involve some of the major organizations that are involved with getting information about neuropathy. Obviously the Western Neuropathy Association is one. And we'll talk about some of the others. I have commentary about each of them, what they tend to be good at, what they tend maybe not to be as complete about. Uh, we, of course, here at WNA hope that we overall are the most complete site. <laughs> We've been going through a website revision to that end lately. But we'll talk all about those once we get through the first series. So let me go on to the next slide and talk about the one that I always start with. This is a paper that's actually 25 years old now, but it's so good. It's still one of the major papers for people who aren't neuromuscular neurologists to consult if somebody comes into their office complaining of neuropathic symptoms. It's called an algorithm for the evaluation of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, the link I have here actually shows that it is the American Association of Family Physicians go to neuropathy explanatory paper. That's what AAFP stands for. Um, and these are also known as the Poncelet Protocols because the paper was written by Anne Poncelet, who still, even after all these years, sees some patients at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, she's quite she's quite older now, but she still apparently maintains a bit of a practice there. The reason I like this paper as much as I do is it's written in very plain language for a medical paper. Most of them, of course, are not. And it's got flow charts. It uses pictures. Uh, it's very good in that sense for if you come in with particular symptoms, what tests might be good to try first? what possible causes you might be looking for. And then as the flow charts continue, depending upon the results of the tests, yes or no, or equivocal, then what steps to take next? So you can go down many of these different arms of the flow chart and see what situations might lead to what diagnoses. Uh, a good paper for everybody to know. Uh, certainly, most neuromuscular neurologists know about this. I won't say all neurologists. Not every neurologist has a neuromuscular background. Uh, one joke I once heard from one of my neurology friends who actually uh, emphasizes strokes and things like that. He said that uh, their peripheral neuropathy lecture in neurology class was like one two-hour lecture which is definitely not enough to know about all the potential causes and all the potential symptoms. So this provides a little bit of an adjunct for that, for the ones who don't specialize in it. Okay, the next one, 
which is a very important one and is the most informationally dense site in this group, is the Washington University at St. Louis Neuromuscular Portal. Uh, many of you know about Washington University in St. Louis has a very, very well-renowned medical school and a well-renowned neurology department. The neuromuscular portal, which is listed here, it's basically, you know, wustle.edu natural brain, uh, is probably at this point the most comprehensive database on neurological conditions that exists on Earth. Uh, it is incredibly, incredibly dense. I'm going to show you just a little picture from it, just from the neuropathy differential diagnosis part. And this is only one section of it. They deal with brain conditions. They deal with all manner of other neurological conditions as well. But this is just the starting point for the differential diagnosis page for neuropathy. You can see here the many different ways it can be broken down by the functional involvement, the type of nerves involved, motor, large and small fiber sensory, uh, hereditary, autonomic, uh, the anatomical distribution, what parts of the body it hits, because not all neuropathies start in the toes and feet. Uh, the time course, acute, subacute, chronic, slow, hereditary. Um, the types of nerves that might be affected, uh, whether or not it's an axonal, versus a demyelinating type of neuropathy. Axonal neuropathies have the nerve fibers themselves being attacked. Uh, demyelinating ones involve an attack preferentially to the myelin sheathing that covers the larger fiber nerves. Uh, the associated features that are here, this is very important. Neuropathies are often secondary to something else. Obviously the most well-known one is diabetes, but there are many, many other conditions, autoimmune, toxic, nutritional, even cancerous, that you could actually get specific neuropathy symptoms from. And then a huge laboratory section where they talk about the laboratory tests that are involved. Uh, blood tests, urine tests, uh, results of electromyographies and nerve conduction studies. You can just go through these individual databases. They lead to more and more screens and more and more trees. And it's neuropathy all the way down. Uh, it's incredibly, incredibly dense. Uh, but of course, you don't have to go through the whole thing. You know, only nerds like me tend to do that. And it's constantly being updated. Uh, one of the most important updated parts of this, by the way, since I started using it 20 years ago, is the hereditary section. The Human Genome Project, uh, one of its great successes, has been the discovery of many, many different hereditary neuropathy conditions. Now, some of these have uh, effects only on a small number of people. Uh, some of them have been well known for a while, like Charcot-Marie Tooth Syndrome. But it's important that they list it all in the database, because if you have an unusual set of symptoms, and grandma always complained about nerve, you know, hurting her. And mom and dad have some type of neuropathy symptoms. There might be something they might match you up on. Or, of course, you might have something that's entirely new to your genetic line. But this is something that everyone should know about. And it's a good place to actually, and, you know, I apologize for that little flip there. It's some place that everybody should go and research their own condition to the extent they know about it. Okay, the next one is the Quest Diagnostics Laboratory Neuropathy Paper. This was written as a collaboration between Dr. Norman Latov, who is headed the Wild Cornell Center for Peripheral Neuropathy here in New York for about four decades now. He's also getting on in years. And he basically wanted to make a listing of laboratory tests that should be considered for neuropathic symptoms. It's a small, dense paper, and I'm going to show you the portal that enters into it to give you an idea how this is arranged. Hopefully, you can see this. Uh, they basically have it set up here by types of causes. And some of you may know I've actually done a webinar on unusual causes of neuropathy that 
included a lot of these categories. I'm much indebted to Dr. Leitov and discussions we've had over the years. Uh, they include things like endocrine and metabolic causes. That's where diabetes and thyroid and some kidney causes come in. Nutritional and toxic, vitamin deficiencies, chemotherapy for cancer, heavy metals, things of that nature. Immune-mediated neuropathies, that's a very large category. There are immune conditions that attack other tissues in the body and then also have effects on nerves and immune conditions that are specific to peripheral nerves. So it's a very large grouping. Uh, autoimmune encephalitis, also immune-mediated cause there. Uh, Paraneoplastic neuropathies and monoclonal gammopathies. Those of you who've been in our groups know I talk about these a lot. There are neuropathies that result from cancers. Some of them have to do with the chemical uh, situation that cancers cause and basically having antibodies that interact with peripheral nerve. Some are compressive in nature. Tumors will compress nerves. And some of them are actually cancer conditions in their own right. Uh, many monoclonal gammopathies signal a blood cancer, such as lymphoma or myeloma, which must be treated along with the rest of the symptoms like the neuropathies. Uh, there are also uh, neuropathies caused by infectious or inflammatory causes. Uh, some of you may be familiar now with people who are experiencing neuropathy post-COVID. Uh, Post-viral conditions are actually not that uncommon and probably underdiagnosed. Uh, some people are familiar with the neuropathies caused by HIV infection or Epstein-Barr infection or cytomegalovirus infection, but there are also ones that sometimes come not exactly at the moment of infection, but even after the body supposedly clears it because the immune reaction interacts with nerves. Uh, there are post-flu neuropathies, post-COVID. There are a number of others out there. So this is also a very, very good place to go. And if you click, if you go to this website and click on any of the green areas here, you get into the whole listing of tests that would be involved. Obviously, if it's something like diabetes, they're going to test your blood sugar. Autoimmune neuropathies, they test various antibody levels. But with a lot of these, the tests get fairly obscure, although everything listed here is a blood or a lab or a urine test, uh, because it's all stuff that's analyzed through labs. But there are certainly a lot of things that can be looked for. And it's certainly not a bad idea to get as much of the or as many of these tests as possible. And hopefully they have some diagnostic yield. OK, again, I flicked a little too soon, but I'm going to go to the next paper from Practical Neurology, a fairly recent paper, which is about small fiber neuropathies. People often ask their doctors, and I certainly get this question a lot, about what the difference is between small and larger fiber neuropathies. Uh, this is a good paper to describe small fiber neuropathies. But just so you know, you know, sort of a little thumbnail sketch, the large nerve fibers, most of which have a myelin sheathing or covering on them, are all motor nerves. So nerves that control motion are large fiber and many sensory nerves that control such things as vibration, touch, positional sense, things of that nature. The small fiber nerves, which are only lightly or even unmyelinated in many cases, are the sensory nerves that subsume the sensations of pain and temperature, and also most of the autonomic nervous system that controls involuntary functions. Things like sweating, blood pressure, pupil dilation, uh, things of that nature. So it is true that a lot of people with small fiber neuropathies will not only have sensory symptoms, but autonomic symptoms. Uh, sometimes the autonomic symptoms are not that bad. Uh, subclinical is the term often used. But there are people, including some people I know who are with us today, who have major autonomic symptoms. And this is a good paper to help explain all of that in much more detail than I just attempted to. Okay. 
Another good little thing, you know, speaking of autonomic stuff and speaking of diabetic neuropathy in general, this is a diabetes journal paper authored by Dr. Aaron Vinnick. Uh, Aaron Vinnick, as I've often said, is probably the world's leading expert on the presentations of diabetic neuropathy, the many different kinds of neuropathy that diabetes can cause. Um, I believe his name is on well over 350 medical reference papers, if you go through PubMed and look. Um, there's just so many different ways that this can present. Uh, admittedly, the most common is with pain and numbness in the extremities that slowly climbs, but it's not the only presentation. There are also a lot of autonomic symptoms that are often involved because yes, diabetes tends to go for the small fibers first. And this is a good paper to describe quite a number of those. Now, we're starting to get into the area of more databases and advocacy areas. Neurotalk is sort of a, I guess it's a way station, a combination of the two. Uh, it's the successor to Brain Talk. It was started by Dr. John Grohol as a companion to the Psych Central Board during a major crash of data talk, Brain Talk's database some years back. In fact, it's about 15 years back now. Uh, before the advent of social media, this was the discussion board to go to about neurological conditions. Uh, the peripheral neuropathy section was always one of the busiest. Uh, I am Glenn Taj on NeuroTalk for anybody who's ever been there. And the real value of NeuroTalk, other than the discussion back and forth amongst people about anything and everything, symptoms, treatments, testing, is the database that are each on each of the sites. And I'm actually going to show you what these tend to look like. Here is actually a screenshot from the front page of NeuroTalk. So you can see the different board areas, the subdivisions. They have the new member introductions and the community informed feedback. And below all this are forums for individual neurological conditions. At the top of each one, there's always a section called useful websites, which, of course, is part of where I got the idea to do what I'm doing today. Uh, this was one of the first places I went to when I was starting to research my own condition. Uh, the peripheral neuropathy section's useful website section has literally hundreds of papers referenced in it. Uh, the Ed Ponsolet paper is there. The Washington University site is there. A number of the other ones that I've talked about are there, plus many, many others. Uh, this is certainly not as busy a place as it once was. Uh, people tend to gather on social media these days. But in terms of being an archive and a great database of information, this is just a wonderful place to go and look. And obviously, you get people's individual takes on these as well. The next one I'll talk about, and now we're starting to get into advocacy more, is the Neuropathy Commons, which is the site of Massachusetts General Hospital's Neurology and Neuropathy Program. Uh, they're a leading research center into neuropathy. They have a lot of good information on there on diagnostics, types, genetics, current research that's going on. And the most unusual part of this, and one of the reasons I wanted to include it, is they have an unusual section there for younger patients, teens and kids. Uh, certainly people think of neuropathy as a disease that affects older people. And to a great extent, that's true, but it's not entirely true. There are kids who get neuropathy for any one of a number of reasons, whether it's autoimmune, toxic, nutritional. And this site actually helps to get some of that discussion going and to present for younger people looking here stories of younger people with neuropathy. Uh, it looks like this. This is the home page of it. You can see the little teens and kids part here on the right side. Uh, obviously, they have to have the find the doctor section because this is affiliated with Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, the Neuropathy Commons, it, like I said, it's a very good place to go to find basic information, as are a lot of these sites, of course. And for younger people, or even for younger people just wanting to know like about their relatives who are older that have neuropathy, 
it's a good place to be. Okay, next thing. The Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy, which is Midwest-based in Chicago, in fact. Uh, this currently is the major neuropathy nonprofit research-based organization. Uh, many of you out there may remember the Neuropathy Association, which disbanded in 2017, amidst a lot of uh, questions that I won't get into. Although if anybody ever wants to talk to me about it, as I did work with them, I certainly have my take on it. But um, the foundation took over a lot of their function and research material. Uh, it's currently the only neuropathy organization that has full-time paid staff that only works in neuropathy. Um, none of the other organizations do. The others are volunteer, or in our case, we share some resources with other organizations at WNA. The basic idea with the foundation is they're heavily research-based. Their board of directors is mostly medical. Uh, they're affiliated with Northwestern Hospital and the Jack Miller Center for Peripheral Neuropathy. Uh, Jack Miller is a neuropathy sufferer and a major fundraiser, successful businessman who gave a lot of the seed money to set this up. Uh, there are some good tips here. They have a living with neuropathy section where people write in to say, I'm experiencing this. What can I do? And get a lot of different answers. So I will show you what their portal looks like. Many, of course, of you have seen it. This is a screenshot of the homepage uh, to improve the lives of patients living with peripheral neuropathy. Uh, they keep some database material. They keep a list of support groups out there, although it does need to be updated. I'm constantly teasing them about that. Um, they don't have really all the context there. And a lot of the um, material on the support groups there is somewhat outdated, not their fault. Obviously, COVID killed a lot of the um, support groups that were live. Uh, most of them moved online. But there are other sections there that also have other patient resources that people can go through. Another organization you guys should all know about is the Neuropathy Action Foundation. Uh, they're also based primarily on the West Coast in Arizona for the most part. And they're notable for actually doing a lot of lobbying and research knowledge building in state legislatures. Most of the foundation lobbying is on the federal level with the Department of Defense and the National Institutes of Health. But uh, NAF sort of took it in a different direction and really tries to work on the state level to get some of the hospitals and other medical centers in those states doing more work with neuropathy. Uh, it also works to make treatments such as IVIG more readily available. Uh, there are a number of legislators and legislative aides on their board. And they also, of course, have basic information about neuropathy. I'll show you what their portal looks like. Whoops. <laughs> I keep hitting that more than once. But here's the um, front page of the Found Neuropathy Action Foundation. Uh, they do some fundraising. And again, all volunteer. Uh, a lot of what they do, as I said, is in the realm of lobbying and getting the message out there. And now, of course, have to mention like where we are now, the Western Neuropathy Association, which started out primarily as a peer-to-peer organization. Uh, Bev Anderson followed it, you know, uh, started it in 1998 as a loose affiliation of, at the time, live support groups. Uh, Bev did a tremendous amount of work with it over more than two decades. The um, attempt to get more people involved, not only in support groups, but in peer-to-peer uh, -peer advice and in building a database for the website has been ongoing ever since. Uh, Bev, of course, is much older now and recently stepped down from presidency position at WNA. Uh, there has been a good transition with WNA of people who have gone on to volunteer to work with it, particularly on the board of directors. I'm one of them. Uh, a number of the other people who I'm sure are on the board of directors are here today. Uh, we're also sending it through currently an update of the website and information, which is why 
This picture here is not exactly what the portal looks like. I debated changing it, but I said, yeah, you know, I won't change it because the complete update of the website is not 100% done yet. Uh, unless Catherine Stenzel tells me differently. But um, the next time I do this, you know, it probably will be. And I'll put the new portal on in, which is somewhat, I think, better arranged than this one. But uh, WNA now runs more support groups than any other neuropathy organization in the world. Uh, we have four of them that go on each month online. And there is still some live ones that go on in California and Texas. So we try and get the word out there. And Western, people have asked me about Western Neuropathy Association. Isn't that like a little bit of a misnomer? Yeah, now it is because we have people from all over the United States, some in Canada, and even occasionally people from overseas. We've had some people, I think, as far away as Australia and New Zealand come to occasional groups. So um, I, I tend to tell people now Western Hemisphere, but even that's not entirely correct. But uh, certainly we have a lot of information on there. Uh, but the focus is probably always has been and always will be on support groups and getting people to feel that they're not alone. Uh, the other initiative which I wanted to bring to the table and have a lot of support now with on the board of directors is getting the various neuropathy organizations, some of which we've mentioned here, working more in concert with each other in order to have just a much better united presence in getting attention to the condition and getting research monies towards it. Uh, it's terrible, of course, that, you know, I guess like seven out of 10 people, you say the word neuropathy and they go, what's that? Despite the fact that approximately one in every 15 people in the world will experience some type of neuropathy over the course of their lives. It's not a rare condition at all, but it's one that doesn't get talked about anywhere nearly enough. Okay, so I've been talking for a long time now. This is the part where we question questions and comments and stuff. And I'm gonna open the Q&A up, for, or should I open the chat up first? I'm trying to figure out. Um, and let's see who's in the chat just who have access to your size, the presentation slides and recordings will be made available later. Yes, we will post this all on our website and of course on our YouTube channel. WNA has a YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and put in Western Neuropathy Association, you will absolutely find it. And you can see all of the various different webinars and other presentations, including for our uh, yearly convocations that we've done you know, over the decades. There's a lot of material there and it needs more views. So please go there and watch stuff. Uh, and let's see, uh, I'm Marty over here is saying, can see and hear me, but can't speak. Yeah, nobody can really speak to me now, Marty. That's the way this was set up. And we're trying to keep people just to make sure that they put stuff into the Q and A and into the chats. And I think, that's it for the chat currently, right? Let's see. Anybody else asking questions here? I think uh, technical questions. So I think that was nothing specific for. Okay. Yeah. Time. Nothing neuropathy related. You know, it's right. all Zoom related. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, all right. So here, here is some stuff in the Q&A. And, you know, people feel free, you know, type in stuff if you have other questions. Can vertigo be associated with diabetic neuropathy? If so, any ideas on how to address it? Uh, the short answer to that is, yep, not common, but it does happen. Obviously, balance is part of the things that neuropathy can affect. Uh, the semicircular canals and even the cues you get through your eyes. Um, a lot of people, and we've talked about this sometimes in our support groups, have talked about vestibular retraining, where there are particular types of therapists often associated with either uh, physical therapy or an occupational therapy practice that actually work with patients on this. So it's redeveloping balance, not just from the sensations that you get from, say, your fingers and your toes, but also for those cues that you get in through the vestibular system. And certainly it may take a little of searching for that. 
Uh, it's a very specialized area of therapy, but it's certainly something that while perhaps it can't be completely uh, eliminated, it can certainly be mitigated. Um, there are also some medications that are used for these, but I tend to be the type of person that likes to go for the like physical therapy first or the occupational therapy first, if possible. Uh, so yeah, there are ways to do that. And certainly, you know, uh, certain other people I'm sure here can actually talk about this at some of our upcoming groups. Um, another anonymous attendee who I always assume is Catherine, uh, says, has it been proven that statins can cause neuropathy? Uh, I guess proven is a loaded word. There is definitely an association in some people between neuropathy or myopathy or both. Myopathy is muscle breakdown, by the way, uh, in concordance with statins. Uh, certain statins more than others, uh, lovastatin particularly. Um, there are certain statins that seem less prone to that, and it certainly doesn't happen to everybody. But yes, if your physician requests that you go on a statin and you are a neuropathy sufferer, it's worth bringing up and having that discussion. Now, obviously, the kind of people that want to put you on a statin, PCPs and cardiologists, may not be as versed in neuropathy issues as you might be or that a neuromuscular neurologist might be. So it might be the type of thing where if you do have a neurologist, that person consults the neurologist too. Uh, it doesn't mean that no one with neuropathy shouldn't take statins, but it's definitely something that is a consideration. Uh, and can I spell out that therapy that I am referring to? Vestibular, V-E-S-T-I-B-U-L-A-R. Hopefully that helps, Lynn. Um, and you can actually, you can do a Google search for it. You can talk about like occupational therapy for dizziness or vertigo and get a lot of information about it. Okay, and Arthur is asking about laser and electromagnetic therapies. I've talked about this at some length in some of the support groups. They've been around a long time. In fact, I always joke that the very first appointment I had at the Weill Cornell Center for Neuropathy that day, and I was there for many hours for a lot of testing, there was a person there who was giving a presentation, a sales presentation, on anodyne therapy which is one of the electromagnetic therapies. It basically uses red light and near infrared supposedly to help with the production of nitric oxide in the bloodstream and then in the dilation of small blood vessels to bring more nutrients and oxygen to damaged nerves and help some of the toxins get out. Certainly some people have had some success for this. I tend to think that it's probably likely to be more effective for people whose neuropathies are ischemic in nature. And by that, I mean circulatorily based. Uh, diabetic neuropathy is one of them. Uh, certainly some of the anti-nuclear antibody autoimmune neuropathies in the lupus family of diseases, lupus, Bechet's, polyarteritis nodosa, uh, giant cell arteritis, Sojourn syndrome. Some of these might try it because a lot of the damage there is to blood vessels and connective tissue that then secondarily damages nerves. Other types of neuropathies, I'm not as sure that it would be necessarily as effective. And I haven't heard as many good things over the years from people who try it. Um, so... Yes, it seems that um, maybe, I mean, there are a lot of things out there that one can try. There's also the Rebuilder, which uses magnesium salts to hopefully get some of the better nerve conduction going. There's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, some of it may be effective for some people, but there's also a lot of scams out there. And since I spoke about the YouTube site and our website uh, a couple of months back, and some of you may have been at this, we had a webinar on neuropathy scams and 
how to be cautious and suspicious of a lot of the stuff out there. I'm sure a lot of you get all sorts of emails about neuropathy cures and, you know, how to get rid of neuropathy in six weeks. Uh, we all tend to look pretty askance at that because it just, you know, if it really did work, we'd all know about it and we wouldn't have to be here. Uh, so I tell, tell people, you know, I take that all with a grain of salt. I'm not saying that none of it is ever in a, you know, completely ineffective, but it's hard to really gauge whether any of these are effective across a large group of people. Now, Bill wants me to talk about my latest email about Parkinson's disease in the gut. Uh, I'll mention this in a minute. Those of you who want to read about this, the Washington Post put this article in today about how there's increasing research that apparently some of the uh, people who have non-hereditary Parkinson's, the cause of it may start in the neurons of the gut in which proteins fold incorrectly and produce a lot of gunk there that helps to jam up signals. And that eventually it leaks from the gut into other parts of the body and then into the brain stem. Um, I don't want to get like heavily, heavily into this. You guys can go read the article and look at the references and go further. But uh, the reason this is promising, and it may have some connection to neuropathy, because the gut has an enormous number of autonomic nerve fibers in it, is that things that affect the gut brain down there, all of the nerves that control the gastrointestinal symptom, tend to have effects in other parts of the body eventually. And, you know, it's, I certainly wanted to throw it at people today just because I myself wonder if there are neuropathies that may start that way. And obviously there's one very evident neuropathy that has effects this way, and that's gluten neuropathy. People with celiac often have neuropathy. There are autoimmune crossovers from the attack on the gastrointestinal system and nerves elsewhere in the body. So... That's something that we can do. So let's see. That's the last one I have here. There's another. Uh, and Shauna put in vestibular therapy. Thank you, Shauna. See, I know if I talk about it, Shauna or Catherine or somebody else will throw something in there. What other questions, I guess, do people have at this point? I'm trying to see if there's anything else that's here. Uh, and I'm trying to see anything else left in the chat, anything in the q and A. I'm not seeing any new stuff. Uh, oh, I heard something. Tom Callahan raised a hand. <laughs> I was going to say, Tom, how's your typing, Tom? Do you want to try and do this live? What I'll do, by the way, is I will stop the screen share so my face will pop back up more. And it gives me a little bit more room to see like Q&A stuff. Um, hey, Glenn, I was just going to ask, do you think, can you think of anything just off the top of your head since you did this presentation last, any major breakthroughs or any significant changes that are noteworthy for folks that maybe attended last time or maybe some new folks who weren't here last time? Well, we're still waiting to hear, I didn't bring this up because this is still sort of in limbo. We're still waiting to hear upon the results of the Win Santor third uh, stage three trial for nerve regeneration. Again, this is something we've talked about in some of the groups. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I will actually see if I can just throw this into the chat, if it'll let me type. Uh, those of you who don't know about Wind Santor, so named because they have people there from Winnipeg, San Diego, and Toronto, uh, they have repurposed a drug that was used for gastrointestinal problems that seems to show at the very least small fiber nerve regeneration. And they went through a pretty decent phase two trial, although I'd love to see, and I'll probably be trying to talk with them again soon, some of the actual raw data from it. Uh, and they're going into stage three trials now. The 
idea behind this is that it seems to have an effect to regrow nerves. And nerves do regenerate if you can stop the damage to them, but they regenerate at incredibly small rates. And sometimes for like small fibers that may go from the spine to the toes, the usual figure I'm given is something like a millimeter a day. So if you're thinking about three feet worth of nerve, you could get regeneration months to years. It's a very slow process. Supposedly their drug is gonna speed up the process and stimulate the nerve growth cones. Uh, but I'd like to see more evidence of that. And I'd also like to see what people report in terms of their symptoms while that's going on. It's fairly well known from spinal research that regenerating nerves, because they tend not to regenerate in the same pathways they were in originally before they were damaged, can produce all sorts of weird sensations in the process to the extent that you might think your neuropathy is getting worse. Uh, this certainly happened to me at points where I got all sorts of bizarre, you know, sensations, but they did eventually over weeks and months damp down and eventually disappear. Uh, as I've said, you know, I'm one of those people that's gotten considerable nerve regeneration over time. Uh, the, uh, the idea in my case is that whatever autoimmune molecular mimicry process caused the damage eventually burnt itself out, probably after burning most of my small fiber nerves out. And then slowly over time, as demonstrated by various skin biopsies over two decades, I'm getting some regeneration of nerve. I still have some symptoms, certainly not like they were when this first happened. I, I tell people I'm usually about like 80% better. Uh, some days it's 90, some days it's not. Some days it's 60 or 70. But um, there are definitely uh, opportunities apparently going on there to try and get nerve regeneration. Uh, Arthur in here also asked about stem cell treatments. That's always an area of research, but there hasn't been a lot of good evidence yet for peripheral nerve. Uh, they tend to get more money to pursue that for like spinal cord injuries. Uh, eventually though, yes, I mean, it's certainly an area that is promising. If you can revert things back to the original stem cell areas, you can get the cells to redifferentiate and presumably create any kinds of cells you want. The question I think is to get those cells to go to the right places and assume the proper functioning once they become differentiated. Uh, Tom has a thing here about exercise versus pain reduction. Uh, exercise is certainly good for pain reduction. I do tell people that you should exercise to tolerance. Uh, obviously, some people's tolerance is more so than others. And sometimes even to a little greater perhaps than tolerance because it is unlikely you're gonna further damage nerves by exercising them. And hopefully you're going to do two or three things. One, you'll get more oxygen and nutrients to them, generally a good thing. You'll get more toxins circulating out of them, generally also a good thing. And hopefully by doing training in those areas, you can recruit other nerve fibers to take over function for those that may be too damaged to function. So, you know, exercise, almost never a bad thing, almost always a good thing. I always have to say almost, because for those people who have neuropathic symptoms say, because they have major spinal problems or because they have nerve compression in the pelvis, yeah, that has to involve a very specialized exercise program so you don't keep on compressing those areas. Uh, it's also, of course, why in those cases, sometimes surgery is indicated. Okay, what else do we have? Because uh, that sort of answers those. Who else has got something? I keep getting more messages on the Q and A part, but not when I bring them up, I don't have new messages in them. So I'm wondering what that's about. Uh, but what else? So see now Tom and one other raised hands, I would say like throw it into the Q and A. And I'll try and grab it as you, you know, as I see them pop up. 
or or if it's faster, because I do have the webinar chat up now, you can throw it into the chat. I don't know what is faster or more technologically feasible for everyone, because I guess it depends upon whether you're doing this on a laptop, a desktop, a phone, a tablet. Okay, oops, did something just come in? Recommendation for types of exercise. Uh, I actually recommend two different things. Uh, I like people to get aerobically as fit as they can. Uh, obviously, the older you get, the less aerobic capacity you have, but you can still increase your aerobic capacity over time. Uh, you definitely can do anything from sitting exercises to just plain walking, even if it's slow walking, and even if you need a cane or a walker with it. Uh, some people who have the ability to get more ambitious and they will do like in-place jogs or they will get on a treadmill. Uh, you can do all of these things. But I am a big fan of weightlifting. Now, not in the insane way that I do it because I am a quite serious weightlifter uh, and you know I have the too much ain't enough idea, which is why I'm constantly pulling and straining things. But building muscle is very important, especially for those of us who have neuropathy and maybe experiencing muscle loss, either from the neuropathy itself or lack of activity. And you want to get as strong as possible, which also helps, by the way, to get more nerve fibers recruited to the musculature. Now, don't do like I do. You know, I, I can lift my body weight and more. Uh, and I think for most people, doing light weights is fine. Uh, you can get little hand weights, little dumbbells. You can work with them. There are many, many different, you know, things you can consult online through YouTube. Uh, meant for older people, meant for people with disabilities that can help you with this. But I do think it's good to try and build a little muscle, no matter how elderly you might be. Uh, it also has the advantage, by the way, for those people that are diabetic or pre-diabetic, with helping with that considerably. Uh, muscle is the tissue in the body that is least prone to insulin resistance. The more muscle you have, the more generally you can regulate insulin better and hopefully, you know, keep that problem from exacerbating diabetes or pre-diabetes. Uh, will the slide websites be available later? Actually, not only will the whole presentation be available later, but a lot of this, I believe, is accessible through the website. I originally did this as a uh, just an old plain PDF Word document with the same websites, which I believe is on the uh, WNA website at this point, and if not, it soon will be. Uh, so you can actually just you know go through there, and obviously you know if when this is posted online and on the website uh, and also on YouTube, you can go in there and just copy off the websites if you want. Uh, some of them are just very easy to find. Obviously, the organizations. Uh, for the one like, if you put in, say, an algorithm for the evaluation of peripheral neuropathy, you'll get the Poncelet paper. You can put in Washington University Neuromuscular and get right in there. Uh, some of the other ones are a little bit more obscure. Neurotalk, just put in Neurotalk. Very, very, very easy to find this stuff. Okay, what else? What else do we have? Uh, I don't think anything left in the chat. Did I answer all the Q&A stuff? People have more Q&A stuff? Uh, oh, great. Yes. Okay, yes. I believe Lindsay in our office just put in the PO and help resource links and more. You can visit this link for a lot of the information. Yes, you can. Okay. Anybody else got stuff? Remember too, we talk a lot about this 
in our um, support groups. You know, many people I'm sure who are here today come to our support groups. I recognize names. But those of you who don't should, at least occasionally, uh, we run them now. There are four of them online. One of them is pretty specialized. The more general ones, one, the second Saturday in a month, the third Wednesday in a month, and the fourth Saturday in a month. And there's also a specialized one that John Phillips and uh, Shauna just actually helped start, which is for people with autoimmune neuropathies, particularly if they're getting therapies like IVIG and the like, that's going to be running in the late afternoon slash evening, I believe on the third Wednesday of the month as well. So that means like the third Wednesday a month, I have to keep myself available for two of them. Uh, what else is here? Carpal tunnel problems with neuropathy post-surgery. Uh, and Tom says, I was an intense weight trainer, but I'm an exercising water in the pool and feel it's very effective. Yeah, I mean, exercising in a pool is great. It suspends your weight and pushing against the water in the pool can be very much similar to weightlifting. Uh, you know, if you have access to water exercise, I highly recommend it. And it's fun, you know, because you get to stick yourself in a bathing suit and splash your compatriots. Um, carpal tunnel problems with neuropathy post-surgery. Yeah, carpal tunnel is a neuropathy. Uh, certainly, there have been a higher incidence of carpal tunnel with our keyboarding tendencies over the last few decades. Uh, carpal tunnel is also the place where people who have neuropathy from uh, hypothyroidism tend to notice their symptoms first, simply because the wrist, the carpal tunnel, uh, the cubital tunnel, the elbow, and the tarsal tunnel down by the ankle are areas that are very narrow. There's a lot of structures that pass through them, and it's very easy to compress nerves there. Uh, in the case of hypothyroidism, the body tends to produce as a metabolic byproduct something called mucin, which also tends to clog up those areas and can compress things more. Uh, I'm not surprised by this, but the one thing I do tell people is that carpal tunnel surgery, where the carpal tunnel is caused by overuse injuries, like a lot of keyboarding, tends to be more effective than carpal tunnel surgery, where there are other factors contributing to that part of the neuropathy. Uh, none of us are exempt from being multiply morbid. Uh, and as I've often said in the support groups, there's a name for this. It's called the double crush phenomenon, which is a situation in which a systemic cause of neuropathy, such as diabetes, produces symptoms, but then additional compression, mechanical or otherwise, can produce symptoms that's greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, it's why, for instance, people with diabetes who have spinal problems, the surgery is often not as effective for them. And it wouldn't surprise me if there is the same situation with people who have carpal tunnel. Uh, I don't know if that like helps or, you know, it, it, it may help to explain why carpal tunnel surgery is not always great. Uh, but you know, it's, it's certainly something that should be discussed with a surgeon, especially if you suspect you may have some neuropathic effects from other types or meta, you know, other types of systemic metabolic autoimmune causes. Uh, my wife is one of these people. My wife took a fall back in 2017, broke her arm right above her elbow, definitely had neurological problems, but because she's also pre-diabetic. The surgery she had there, while somewhat effective, has not been completely effective because there is like more than one thing going on. So she still has some numbness in the fingers and the back of her hand, you know, not as bad as it was before, admittedly. But, um, you know, there's more than one factor involved. Okay, what else, people? Um I'm still waiting for people to see if they want to add anything else in. But I think I've answered all the ones that are there. I think I've actually got it down to no open questions now, right? <laughs> 
Anything else? Going once, going twice, going a third time. Um, but if not, you know, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank Lindsay for keeping track of the tech while this has been going on. You know, I hope you guys picked up on something. I hope you guys will have more ammunition for the future. You'll have stuff that you can look up. Uh, I, by the way, you know, I'm generally at all four of those uh, support groups online each month. Uh, as are many of the other people I'm sure are here, uh, Catherine, Shauna, uh, you know, we're all there. We're all pretty knowledgeable. We all like to answer questions. I do also field questions online. Uh, I'll probably regret this, but I figured what the heck, most of you have this anyway. I threw my email into the chat, at least a short one, which is glentosh at yahoo.com. And, you know, people do ask me questions. And if I know something about it, I will answer back and I'll send you references. Uh, I agree, Tom, the newsletter is great. Uh, Catherine Stenzel ed edits that and puts it together each month. And she's really, really good at it. Uh, I'm sure also that if people run across things that are interesting about neuropathy, articles or things they run across, you should definitely email Catherine with it. Uh, sometimes it winds up in the newsletter. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure Catherine's always looking for stuff to put in there. Okay. So what do you think? Do you think we should knock off, Lindsay? You think, think we're done? Yeah, we're just over an hour. <laughs> and I think we uh, exhausted the... <laughs> like, <laughs> We've okay, exhausted we'll everyone in the audience. <laughs> um, but no, I think we're good. Okay. Like I said, I all appreciate you guys coming. Uh, do drop in on us. The next um, support group, now I have to make sure I get the day correct, right? I believe it's October the 13th. That's the second Saturday in October. Of course, October starts on a Sunday. Uh, October 14th, no, am I wrong about that? Uh, uh, October 14th is the second Saturday virtual support group. It is group. the second, okay, sorry about that. See, I got to learn to like look at the calendar before I say these things. Uh, okay, one through seven, yeah, eight through 14. Yes, you guys are right. And uh, then the Wednesday one will be the Wednesday right after that, which I am assuming is the, uh, is that the 18th? Yeah, it's yes. going to be very close together. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'll have one on the 28th and I will consult with John to see if his autoimmune group is going to be on the 18th as well. Yeah, uh, we, we delayed yeah. it a week this month. But the um third maybe Wednesday, back to the third Wednesday. Yeah. They'll both be on that same day. So one's uh earlier in the day, and then the C, the um autoimmune group, they're gonna be later in the afternoon. Yes, and I believe we're going to have another webinar in October. Am I right about that? Yes, uh, I think <laughs> <laughs> tentatively, yes. The 26th is the date um, okay. that we're holding for that one. All right. So thank, I guess, you know, I, I've said it a couple of times, but thank you all for coming. You know, many of you will see you again fairly soon in about two weeks and two days. Yes. Oh, all right. Perfect. One. Oh, okay. just a thank you. Th thank you. You're welcome, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, right. Glenn. Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. Thanks, everybody. Right. We'll see y'all soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.